Welcome back, folks. Welcome back to another special episode of the Soul Talk podcast. You know, each week I do my best to share some insight, inspiration, and wisdom from my own life that I feel might serve you in some way to live more authentically and more fulfilled. Each week we have amazing guests from all walks of life. Today is no different. I actually read this man's books uh, uh, a few, quite, quite a few years back. And so when I had the opportunity to have him on Soul Talk, I was like, absolutely. I was thrilled. I, I know you're going to be inspired. Uh, I think your soul is going to uh, definitely ignite from today's conversation. Uh, the man was born in Brooklyn, one of my new favorite places. Educated Amherst, Sorbonne, Yale. This is what I like. The educated through intensive Zen practice. I got some questions about that. Uh, his many best-selling books, uh, interpretations, translations of the Tao Te Ching, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Read those two, which really uh, turned me onto his work and uh, his books, The Gospel of Jesus, The Book of Job, Meetings with the Archangel. Uh, he also co-wrote uh, books with uh, the amazing Byron Katie, who he's married to, Loving What Is, which awesome book, A Thousand Names for Joy. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Soul Talk, Stephen Mitchell. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very glad to be with you. Yeah, awesome to have you on. Uh, I've been a, I don't say a fan, but I've been inspired for quite a few years. And so uh, I know you, uh, you just came out with a new book. Joseph and the Way of Forgiveness, which I am looking forward to hearing about and asking you about. Very curious about that. I grew up, you know, in the church, and so hearing that story, and uh, I'm really curious to to kind of hear your perspective on that. So, folks, check that out. Joseph and the Way of Forgiveness. You know, as we start the interview, Stephen, I, I'm always I'm personally curious myself, and I think the readers might be, especially if they don't know of your work before we deep dive. You know. Born in Brooklyn, so born Yale. I mean, how 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 does it how, how do you get to Zen practice and then writing about uh, translating writing books on sort of wisdom and you know spirituality and soulfulness and perennial wisdom philosophy? I mean, how how does that happen? I'm just curious from your childhood to that transition and tell me a bit about that that journey yes, in a not- nutshell. It's odd. It's odd that someone from my kind of background would uh, end up as Zen training. And I kind of, I backed into it. Uh, The short version of the story is this, that when I was at at Yale in graduate school, um, my first girlfriend, whom I had been with for two years, uh, broke it off with me. And the pain in my heart was so intense the the sense of um, failure and desperation was so powerful that I didn't know what to do. There was there was nothing I could do but but suffer. And to try to find a way out of it, I looked through the Bible, which was really my only point of reference for spirituality at that point. I knew Christianity and I knew Judaism, which I had grown up in, and knew nothing about Taoism or Buddhism or anything of that sort. So what I found that was helpful to me was the book of Job in the Bible, because I thought that was the point in the Bible that most profoundly addressed the question of human suffering. And when I read it, I read it over and over in the King James translation. And um, it seemed to me that at the end of the book of Job, in a section that's often called The Voice from the Whirlwind, the poet who wrote that book had seen something essential about human suffering and the way out of suffering. And I felt as a as a 22-year-old man young man in this predicament, that if I could somehow understand what that great poet had understood, then I would be able to deal with the suffering in my heart. So uh, with that, with that realization, I proceeded to learn Hebrew so I could get closer to uh, the, the poet who wrote the book of Job. So I learned Hebrew and then I found out that in order to do a really good job, I would have to learn textual scholarship because the book of Job is a bit of a mess in Hebrew. 
And then after mm-hmm. that, I I had to learn comparative ancient Semitic philology, and I won't bore you with the details. But the 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 aftermath of this is that for six years, I studied the Book of Job and translated wow. the Book of Job. I was translating it into English verse, which had never been done before, because it has this kind of ferocious beauty that you can't really hear unless you hear the the rhythms of the verse. So that took me six years. And at the end of six years, I woke up one morning realizing that I was no closer to understanding that great poet's insight than I was at the beginning and that I would have to meet someone, excuse me, who embodied that wisdom in the flesh rather than essentially that I wasn't going to get it from any words on the page, however magnificent they were. So so I began to study Hindi. I, my intention was to go to India and try to meet a great master. And before uh, a month was up, I bumped into a Zen master in Providence, Rhode Island, and told him what I was about to do, go to India to, to try to find a teacher. And he said, no, you stay with me. I will teach you. And um, mm. and a year later, after uh, after uh, a year of intensive Zen meditation, I found myself in the middle of Job's whirlwind, and I all my questions about suffering were answered. It was it was bright, it was clear, it was it was beautiful. It, I mean, everything that I had wished for uh, came mm. came through for me at that point, and and um, and I really made a, a a large step forward to to ending all of my suffering so that's that's how i got wow. into the the business of translating and zen practice etc yeah. and yeah. you know when i said de-educating myself uh, it was that everything that I, that i had learned in school uh, had to go out the window in in the process of this um, huge entrance into what my Zen teacher called the don't know mind, the mind that's completely mm-hmm. open, that doesn't get stuck on anything it thinks it knows. So that's that's a mm-hmm. a, a brief answer to your question. 